Hi, this video covers my experiences with free open source software called KiCad to draw circuit diagrams and create printed circuit board layouts. I'm assuming no prior knowledge of KiCad for anyone to watch through this. There is an index to the video so you don't have to faff around with watching hour long videos for no reason. You can jump to the bits you're interested in. You can download and install KiCad onto your PC from the KiCad.org website. When you launch KiCad, this is the main control panel. And on the right hand side here is the palette of the different applications that you can launch. And on the left hand side is a view of the files of your project. So you can go to file, new project and create one there. And of these applications here, really you need to be familiar with at least the most important ones, the top four ones here. Uh, but actually the fifth one is useful too. And that's important as well, unless you're gonna be using some external Gerber viewer because there are many third party ones and you might have a favorite one. Anyway, for now, so if you create a project, and then you can launch the schematic editor. So working top down, basically. When you launch the schematic editor, it comes up like this. First off, I strongly recommend you examine the preferences here because it's possible to make life a lot more comfortable if you're coming from using a different CAD package. In my case, I was migrating from Eagle CAD and the transition was made easier by going to the mouse settings here, then setting things up as shown here with these boxes unchecked zoom speed setting set to low and then the left mouse button was set to this drag any object settings also under display options here i set the grid to lines mode if you wanted you could also create your own color theme here as well i created one here okay back to the schematic editor you can turn the grid on or off by just clicking here if you want to and really this is quite easy to use you use a key press the a button uh, for adding a component, R for rotating it, V to select a value for the component like 10K, 20K for a resistor or whatever. And you can hit escape to back out. And you can also use the usual control key combinations like copy, paste, undo, a standard, you know, control X, etc. And you can press the X or Y button to flip a component along the X or the Y direction. And that's it really. Those are the, the most important ones. But you can also always just check by clicking on list hotkeys and see the letter assigned to different commands if you if you want to just check there but anyway yeah so once you're here you just hit the a key and the the first time you do that it might take a little while to bring up um, this list of symbols these are different libraries of uh, components that are available the main important ones here are power and device so you always need a ground symbol and a power symbol so you can just go into power here and pick the symbol that you want and device will contain things like resistors and capacitors so again, that's pretty fundamental. There it is here. So you can see the types of things that are here. If you don't, often you, you won't need to do that though. You can just type here. So if you want to draw in a resistor, then you can just type resistor here and it finds it here. There's a resistor. You can just double click that and then start positioning that somewhere. And then hit escape if you want to. And then you could then start drawing wires to it by just hovering over here and then you can just start making connections. I'm just going to hit escape there and press A again to add another component and this time I'm going to go to the power section so let me just close the device because I want to put a plus 3.3 symbol. I can find one here that will do fine and I can either directly connect it or just put it here and because I'm still in the add mode because I'm not hit escape if I just click anywhere and then come back to here and I can pick another one. So if I just scroll down, I'm just using the center mouse thing to do this. So scroll down to a ground symbol. Okay, that, and then put that somewhere like that. And then I can just hover over there, left mouse click. Oh, um, I'm still in the uh, symbol editor mode. So if I hit escape and hit escape again, now I'm out of that. So now I can just click and then that's done. All right, and like I mentioned, the usual control keys work. So I, I can just um, escape out, select that, press control C, and then go to control V and put that somewhere else. And I hit the R button to rotate that if I want to. None of these have got values. So if I hit escape and now, if I want to assign a value to a component, I just select that one by left clicking on it once and then click V. And V brings up the value thing. So I can, I don't know, 22K. And then do the same thing here, press V. Okay. 
there are a couple of points to address while creating the schematic, and that's concerning the component references, like this one here, and also the footprint for the eventual PCB layout for each of these components. For the component references, there's uh, tools, annotate schematic, which can be used, and you can do that at any point that you want to, and it will automatically assign numbers to all of the components. Uh, for the footprints, you can press the F key, or you can double click on any of the components to see all of the properties. And there's the footprint entry here, and you can then click down here. Or you can actually go to tools again, and you can go to assign footprints. After you've done the annotate schematic, you can do assign footprints. Um, so it's nice that there's several different ways of doing things just to achieve the same result. So for now, for example, if I select that component and then press F, I'll be able to get to here and then I'll click here to see this. So basically now you're looking at the footprint libraries on the left hand side here. And because in KiCad the symbol and the footprint libraries are separate. So this is the footprint library. One important thing I want to close this for now. I just want to say that one thing is that it could get tedious setting the footprint for every single component in the schematic. For example, you might hit F and set this one, and then F to set this one, but there's a good chance that a lot of the components in the schematic are all going to be of the identical footprint. So maybe every resistor and every capacitor is going to be 0603 or 0805 sized or whatever you prefer. So one option then is that rather than place all of your resistors and all of your capacitors on the schematic first, just put down one resistor and then set the footprint for this and then copy paste this elsewhere and change the value elsewhere for whatever values are required and then that can be much quicker so for example if i click on this one and then click on here to click the footprint or i could have just pressed the f key so i'm here and then on the left hand side you can see resistor surface mount device or i could have typed it in here just typed resistor and i found, found it here and then looking down the list here these are all the surface mount ones because that's what i've clicked here so there's 0201 0402 etc so for a basic hand soldering circuit board, I'm going to choose the 0805 one, which is here. And if I just expand this, you can see that the one I've chosen here is underscore hand solder. So the pads are a little bit larger just to make things a bit easier. So if I double click that, it's now there and then I can click OK. So this component has now got a footprint assigned. So if I need more resistors in my circuit, I'm just going to control C and then click elsewhere and control V and place more of them. And then for each one, I can just hit the V button and change the value to whatever was required. Oops, sorry. V and then 100 ohms, for example. So that's, that's how you set the comp component footprint and assign the values after that. Copy and paste and then assign the values for each component. And eventually you'll come to a point where you need to have a custom component, whether that's a custom symbol for for example, a new microcontroller where one doesn't exist in the library, or a custom footprint, or both, and that's the next thing to cover. The symbol editor here is very important. You'll be using it for most schematics, and it's quite easy to use with just a couple of minutes worth of practice. On the left-hand side are the symbol libraries, and I'd suggest that for the first time if you're using KiCad, then you could create yourself a custom global library. So as well as all these off-the-shelf libraries, just create one custom global one for all of your custom symbols. It's up to you how you organize things, but I'm just suggesting that this could be just one simple way of doing it. Just create a single library called user symbols or whatever. And then as it grows, you can use a search filter box here to type and find the symbols of interest in there. So you can just go here, file, new library, and select global, and then give it a name. And then once you've done that, it'll appear here. So I've got like a user global symbol library created here. Also, rather than creating symbols from scratch, an option could be why not just find an existing symbol and copy that into the user library you've just created and edit it. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate. So let's say, let's say I'm using a new four pin voltage regulator. That's a bit like the typical three pin ones. So what I'll do is I'll find a 7805 regulator. If I double click it, you can see it there. Uh, but what I'm going to do is right click here on the symbol and then I can just do save as because what I want to do is save that into my user a, a copy of that into my user global library so there's the name of it i'm going to scroll down and find user global library click that because that's where i want to save it 
but I'm going to give it a different name. So let's say my new four pin voltage regulator is called, I don't know, 4805 regulator. Uh, give it that name and yeah, make sure that that's selected and then click save. And so now if I clear the filter, you'll be able to see that if I go to my user symbol, global symbol library here, I've got some other ones which I'd created, but there it is, the 4805, which um, we're editing here. And uh, I'm just using the center mouse button to scroll in or out. Uh, but you can see the pins here, so I can create another one. So again, the easiest way is just to edit this one. So if I copy, for example, that pin, actually, now I'm going to copy this one. Control C and then Control V. And then I'm going to rotate it by pressing R. And I might want to put it here. Let's say I'll put it here. Now it's all a bit cramped, so I'm going to hit escape. I'm going to select this and just drag it down a bit, maybe here. And then select this from a corner and make it a bit bigger. And maybe that's good enough for a symbol. So now I've got four pins here. But you can see here I copied and pasted and it's got the same pin number. Oh, I've done this wrong as well. It should be out here. There. So you can see here it's got the same pin number and the pin numbering is important because the pin numbers have to associate with the pad numbering on the footprint. So if you're unsure, then bring up the data sheet or the component package and check there to see that the numbering is going to match with whatever you put here on your symbol. Um, so maybe because it's now a four pin component, maybe the output is going to be on pin four instead of pin three. So I just double click that uh, to bring up the properties for it. Change that to pin four. Click OK. And then this one is now going to be pin three. And I'm going to change the name of that to maybe this is a voltage adjust pin. So double click that and change the name of it to adjust and change the pin number to three. Okay. You can also click on the file symbol properties here, file symbol properties, and check that everything is updated for the new symbol. For instance, here there's a data sheet link so I could remove that and paste in a new one there. I could also change the description here to whatever makes sense for this new regulator. So it could be a full pin regulator and, and change any keywords. So yeah, this is useful as well, just to edit that. And then once you're done, click on save. There. The symbol editor is actually highly useful, even if the symbols already exist for your component. Because the reason is that you might just want to customize a part slightly so that the schematic looks neater. Here's an example where let's say I want to add a Pi Pico module. So if I search for Pico and I happen to have a library installed with the Pico. Yeah. And there it is. However, this symbol has got the ground pins on the sides. If I zoom in here, you can see there's a ground pin here. There's another ground pin here. You might want to prefer them all to be at the bottom for cosmetic purposes. So to do that, I'm going to copy this into my own library. So what I would do is then I would just right click here, save as again, and then give it a different name. I could type pico-logical perhaps to indicate that it's a different pico symbol than the, this physical representation one. And I've already done that here. Let me just show you. You can see it here anyway, pico-logical. But otherwise I could have just gone down to here, gone into my user symbol library. And you can see what I've done is I took the existing one and I just took the pins which were ground pins here and I've just moved them here and rotated them and put them at the bottom. So for my particular schematic that I might be working on, maybe this is the symbol I want. And then maybe I'm working on a completely different schematic where maybe these pins here are going to be input pins. And just for ease of interpreting the schematic, I might want to have these symbols on the left hand side and these ones on the right hand side. And so I could actually just and then take these and drag it across to the other side, rotate and place them here. Whatever looks neater for the schematic. And then I would save that as another name here. Then now that you have the symbol, then you can then go back to the schematic editor and place the component symbol by pressing the A key in the usual way that I've shown before. Here's another example where I didn't like the LED symbol. And you can see here it's this triangle with a line down it. Maybe you'd prefer like a filled LED and these arrows don't look that nice. So I did a right click, save that into my user global library. And I'll show you that it's here. So the same thing. I just right clicked here and went to the properties and, and then selected fill. 
So I just change that very slightly and I change these arrow shapes as well. For the pins, you want them to be on the grid, but for anything graphical like this, if you wanted to, you could change the grid slightly. So you could go to grid properties and select a different grid from here, but then always go back to the original grid to for the pins because you, you don't want them off the default grid because otherwise the new wires are not going to connect to that on the schematic. So that's schematics and symbols mainly covered. And now we can move on to creating and editing footprints for the PCB. If you click on the footprint editor, then just like before, a new window will appear where now on the left hand side here, there'll be footprint libraries and these are pre-existing ones. So you should initially create a new user library for yourself to contain new footprints from file, new library. Here I've created one already for myself called user global library. Again, like before, you could find existing near similar footprints and then select save as to store them here into your user global library and then edit them there. And it's definitely worth doing that to gain experience with, for example, the layer names and how footprints are laid out. But for now, I'm going to create a footprint from scratch. Let's say I need a footprint for a six pin device with three pins on each side. And since the measurements are important, dimensions matter and Although you could tie pin values for each one of the pads where they are, it's sometimes easier just to make use of grids to make the positioning of the pads simpler. And there are preset grids here. Or you can click here and select edit user grid if you don't see the grid size that you want here. So as an example, if the component data sheet contains your six pin component here and you can see the spacing between the pads is from center to center is 0.95 millimeters. So I want a 0.95 millimeter grid. So I would click on edit user grid and create that grid there and then select it. So here's my user grid, 0.95 millimeters. Now this circular icon here is used for creating pads and you can click this and place all sorts of pads. So whether it's a through hole one or a surface mount one or even drill holes, they're all done by using this tool. But actually this is all grayed out at the moment because I don't actually have a component created in the library. So what I'm going to do is just Go to my library, right click there and select new footprint and give it a name. And for the footprint type, this is a surface mount one, so I'm going to select that. Otherwise, obviously you'd select through hole if it's a through hole component. But if it's a pad that contains both through hole and surface mount, then select through hole. I, I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. And then select OK. Move these out of the way. This is the reference, component reference. On, it's going to appear on the silk screen because it's yellow. Uh, these two are not going to appear anywhere. These are documentation text. Okay, so now I can start trying to place pads. So I'm going to click here to add a pad and a pad appears and I'm just going to put it here for now. But I'm going to hit escape now to get out of the pad adding mode and then double click this because this is of the wrong dimension. So by double clicking, I'll bring up the properties here. And looking at the data sheet, I can see that these pads need to be 0.9 by 0.7 millimeters. So here I'm going to type 0.9. This will be 0.7. Okay, that's better. And now I can go back to the pad mode and they'll all be that size now. So second one and then the third one, I just click to place them. And I'm not going to place the fourth one just yet. I'm going to hit escape. And I've started these on the center because everything's symmetrical normally in component data sheets. So if you want your origin of the component to be at the center, you might not want it to be at the center for things like connectors where maybe you want it to be on the face of the connector. But for just typical components without user controls or anything, then you know often you just want the center of the component to be at the origin point. So again, I'm going to look at this data sheet and I can see here that from the two sides, from center to center, it's 2.1 millimeters. So half of that is 1.05. So I could create a grid of 1.05 and then select these and move them along left once. But there's another easier way anyway. If I just highlight all of these, right click here, and I can go to these special tools here and then move exactly. And then type in minus 1.05. Yeah. And then carry on adding pads so four five six and then hit escape and again select these right click special tools move exactly and this time move it plus 1.05 okay and now i'm ready to add the silk screen outline for this component 
So again, I would go to the data sheet and I can see here that I need it to be three millimeters by 1.8 millimeters. I'm not going to draw an entire rectangle, but I'm just going to draw lines here and make sure I just select silk screen and the line tool here and just roughly place the lines where they need to be. I'm not going to be accurate here because I'm going to then hit escape, double click on here. And this was 1.8 by three millimeters. So half of 1.8 is 0 0.9. So minus 0 0.9 to plus 0 0.9 and half of three is 1.5. So minus 1.5 here. Minus 1.5. Uh, that's in the correct position. I can do exactly the same thing with this one. Double click. Minus 0 0.9. Uh, 0.5. Perfect, that's done. And I'm going to also put a reference indicator point for the first pin. And you can do that however you want to. I just like using a circle for that. So again, use a silk screen layer, select a circle, and just put one anywhere, hit escape and double click this to get to the properties. And I think a radius of 0 0.3 millimeters is fine for that. And create a field shape there. And to put that in the right place, I'm just going to select a very fine grid, like 0 0.1 millimeters. And then just drag this to where I want it there. Hit escape, that's done. There's another layer that needs to be drawn around the component. That's this courtyard, which defines the physical limits of the component. It's not essential to do that, but I'm going to add that in anyway. To draw that, what I need to do is select that, click once to set the position of one corner and then click again and then hit escape a couple of times. That's it. So that's done. And now I can move these into a more appropriate position. It's about there maybe. There. A very common scenario is to have special shaped pads and they're very straightforward as well. Let's say this pad two, maybe this is a ground pin and it's got a shape that has to go underneath here. So what I would do here is select that pad and then press control E and it goes into this pad edit mode. And what I can do there is pick this polygon shape and then start drawing the shape here. And because this component is so small, I'm actually going to change grid size to maybe 0.25 millimeters. And then just click to set each point. So maybe I'll set it like this. And, there. and if I escape now, that pad is now that strange shape but obviously it's overlapping here. So I can click this, change the grid to something very fine, like 0 0.01 millimeters, and then just zoom in and fine trim this like that. There. Hit escape again. And this should be fine, good enough for like most use cases, but obviously if you've got something very mission critical and you want spot on precision then what you can do it's actually easy to edit all of this in the in the generated text file because every footprint has got its own file so you could just open up the file in notepad make the changes by typing the precise values for this polygon uh, in there and then once you're done you could click on some other component within the library and then click back and then click back to this one and it will reload it so then you'll have the precision that you want as well and once you're done with all of this, you're still in that pad edit mode. So press control E to get out of that. There. This number appears large, but you can ignore that. There's no problem with having it like that. The through hole pad procedure is the same. You still use the same tool. So you would click here, set a pad somewhere, double click that. And this time change this to through hole. Circular, and then maybe it's 1.1 millimeters in diameter with a 0.8 millimeter hole there. And you can create a custom shape around this as well in exactly the same way as was done for this surface mount one. When using through holes, sometimes you need the holes to be slots, i.e. rooted out. And that's surprisingly easy to do. You just create a pad in the normal way and then you can edit it here. And instead of circular hole, change the shape of the pad and the hole shape to be both oval. And so maybe you want the hole to be 
two millimeters wide, one meter tall. That's the, the pad, and then the hole itself could be 1.6 wide and 0.6 tall. That's done. Sometimes shaped holes are needed that don't belong to pads. An example could be a slot for a ribbon cable. And for that, you, all you have to do is just draw the shape of the slot using the edge dot cuts layer here. And you can make the width of the line very thin, like 0.01 millimeters. And then the PCB manufacturer will understand that it's something to be routed out. So to do that, I'm going to create a one millimeter width hole for a flat ribbon cable. I'm going to change my grid to 0.5 millimeters. And then I'm going to start with the curved ends of the slot first. Select the edge cuts layer and the arc tool. And then I'm going to select here. Okay, that's one end of the slot. I'm going to do the same thing somewhere else. So maybe here. Select that again. That. From here to here. And now I'll draw some lines from here to here. And that's the slot done. But the slot has got a thickness here and you don't want that. So you want this fairly thin. Uh, so the way to do that is uh, just to double click on that and change the width to something fine like 0.01 millimeters. And with that, the manufacturer will know what to do. The PC manufacturer, they'll know that you intend that to be like a slot routed out. And you just have to do that for all of them. I don't think there's a way to do this together so you just have to do it manually one by one there if you just want to have a hole like a location hole with no copper around it then that's a bit weird you still have to use this pad tool for that only in this case what you do is you go into the properties and then select NPTH here non-plated through hole and you probably want that circular the whole shape has to be circular because it's a drill hole. And then the key thing is to put both of these values to the same value. So if you want a 2.1 millimeter hole, then you put 2.1 there and 2.1 here as well. And then click OK. And you will get this warning, but that's just the way it is. OK. So that will be a drill hole. Once you're done, you can click on Inspect Footprint Checker and that will run some checks. It doesn't pick up everything perhaps, but it's still useful to do. And there's not much to go wrong here anyway, as long as you follow the data sheet package drawing, pretty much that's it. In summary, to create footprints, you have to make use of the grid. And the, this pad tool is used a lot for basically everything for pad shapes, through holes and drill holes as well. And then press Control E to go to that custom pad mode. And also use the edge dot cuts layer for things like this. Armed with the created symbols and the footprints as required, you can now complete the schematic and assign footprints as needed using the tools assign footprints or the F key against each component. And once you've done all of that, then you can run an electrical rules check or ERC. So this is the schematic I've completed and I can now go to inspect, run electrical rules check and then click here for run ERC. And it probably will find some errors or warnings. So it's important to actually look at each individual one and decide if it's acceptable or not. So I can zoom into the schematic and then click on one of these. And it'll then show me where that error is or warning. And I can then step through all of these and see if they really are problems or not. And so here I've actually got a total of five issues, which I have inspected and I'm satisfied are not real electrical problems. So now I'm ready to launch the PCB editor. So I can close this and then go to here and select PCB editor. It comes up as a blank sheet. I'd recommend examining the preferences from the menu here. At the origin and axis configuration items, it's well worth choosing the display origin to be at the drill place marker. If you don't do this, then the coordinate system within the PCB editor is tied to an origin point zero zero at the corner of the drawing frame, which to me makes no sense. And if you have the configuration as shown here, then you can move the origin to be at the corner of your PCB or the center of the PCB or wherever you like. Secondly, if you've used other CAD systems like Eagle, where moving the pointer up the screen increases the Y coordinate value, then you may want to select this option as I have. One last thing is that in display options, 
what you could do if you find the grid dots hard to see on the display, you could change the thickness of them to say 2.0. So now I can go into here and click on tools, update PCB from schematic. And I can do that at any, any point and it will put the components into the schematic. And then I click on update PCB here. It's given me three warnings here saying that there's issues on switch SW1 and on LCD1 pin one. And I know that this switch has got a couple of through hole pads for just supporting the component. And there's actually supposed to be no net there. And similarly for LCD one pin one, there should be no net anyway. It's a no connect. I'm okay with these three warnings. So I'll just click and close. And I've got these components now attached to the mouse pointer. What I'm going to do is just place them to the side here for now. Next step is to actually draw the PCB outline. Let's say I want 100 by 80 millimeters. I can select the line tool and it's edge.cuts layer, which I want. And then I'm going to just change the grid here to perhaps 10 millimeters, which I don't have here. So I'm just going to click on edit grid settings and change this to 10, 10 here as well. And now I can just draw 100 by 80 millimeters here. I'm using that line tool. I'm going to just change that to the user one, which I just created 10 millimeters there. And then draw the line. I'll start here. This is their 100, so I'll click there and then I'll go up 80 to there, 100, and then back down to here. There, and that's my board outline. If I wanted like curved corners and things, what I could do, for example, let's say I wanted a two millimeter radius curve on here, I would change my grid to two millimeters. Let it use a grid. Two. And then from here, I would draw again on the edge cuts layer from here, there, hit escape. And so there's my two millimeter curve. And now these lines need shortening. So I would just double click on one of these lines and here's the coordinates. And I would change them by two millimeters to shorten it. I'm going to put the origin here. So this will be zero, zero for me. And to do that, I have to go to place, drill, place, file origin. And then just zoom into here and press here. And now you can see by looking here that when I move my mouse to this origin point, it's zero, zero. And this is helpful now because if I want to place switches and things like that, or place holes for the circuit board, I can now do them relative from this position here. Okay, so now I'm ready to start placing these. Select on a component and then just drag it into the right place. Press R to rotate that. Drag it to wherever you want. So this is an LCD with a slot here for a flat flex cable. Press R to rotate that. This is going to be a rotary encoder. So yeah, so you just keep doing that for all of these components one by one, just positioning them wherever you want them. And if you need precise positioning, then you double click on that one, change your positioning here to, I don't know, perhaps 20, 10. That's okay. When you're working in the PCB editor, there's four main keys, which are really useful, which are R, F, X, and M. R is used to rotate components, pick a component, and then just press R. And F is used to flip the component. So if I press F on that component, it'll put it onto the other side of the board. And X is used to actually place traces. So if I click here and then press X, now the trace is actually following the mouse. And if you're not happy with the way that line is coming off from the pad, then if you press a slash key, it swaps to like that. So if by repeatedly pressing the slash key, I can move that. And I just click to layer trace and then keep clicking to put that trace wherever I want. Okay, I'm going to undo that. So that's R, F and X. And one other useful key is the M key, which is really handy because let's say I've got this component here and this resistor, and I, I, I can see this air wave here, which I need to connect. Maybe I want that vertical. So I might try and move this because I've got a grid in the background. I can't actually get this resistor and this capacitor aligned such that these two pads align by just trying to move them here. I can't do that by moving the the capacitor either it's always slightly off it's not exactly straight 
you can see that it's not vertical. So the solution there is if I pick, for example, this pad here and press the M key while keeping my mouse over it, then I can now move this resistor with this pad center now being aligned to the grid. So for instance, if I just place it here like that, and now I can do the same thing with this capacitor. So click on just that pad, press M key here, and now you can see that that's perfectly vertical there. there. So instead of aligning from the center of the capacitor, it's aligned to one of the pads because I, I moved my mouse to the pad and press the M key there. And now if I was to click here and press the X key, I can lay a perfectly vertical trace there. To summarize so far, the general procedure is to click on this tools update PCB from schematic, or you can click on this green icon here, which does the same thing. And you can do this at any time, whenever you make changes to the schematic. The first time around, you can dump all the components by doing that out here. And then you can create the board outline here, this one here, using the edge.cuts layer and then drag the components from the left-hand side or use the M key to move them as well. Drag them in approximate position at the same time using the R key to rotate them or F to flip them onto the other side. And then also make use of this grid settings here, or you can double click on a component value to be able to set the precise position from the component properties. To demonstrate, there's some switches here for this switch. If I bring up the properties, you see here I've got rounded millimeter values here so that I could easily cut holes in an enclosure at 45 and 10 millimeters to match that. And then when you're ready, you can press the X key against any air wire to start converting those air wires into traces. And you can press the V key for a via at any point. So if I click on this one here, press the X key, and then I can start laying this out. And if I need a via somewhere here, then I just press the V key and I can then position that wherever I want to. And now I'm routing on the underside copper layer. And then if I want another via here, I would just press the V key again. There. And you can use your preferred trace widths and via dimensions here. So you can set these up beforehand. And here. The layout process is iterative. And so if you decide to change any footprints as you're doing this, then you can use a tools update footprints menu item from here to include the latest changes. But before you start laying out the traces, you should also set up the PCB design rules by going to File, Board Setup, and then click on Design Rule Constraints. These are highly important to a successful PCB. So I've already set these values up here to suit JLC PCB, simple two-layer board layouts. So you could copy these values if you desired. Other important things are you'll most likely want copper fill, like ground planes. And there is this blue icon here for doing that. It's very easy to use. All you have to do is click where you want to begin your fill and this window pops up and you can select what layer you want. So I went on the bottom layer and you select the net, well, a ground plane, click on OK, and then you're free to continue building up your shape. So I'm going to click here and then up here and then move to here. I'm using the center mouse scroll wheel to move around here. And then I'm going to finish exactly that spot. It automatically stops that and you get this pattern around the lines. And then you have to click B to fill it in. If I press the B key now, you can see it's calculated the copper plane and it's attached it with these thermal relief lines to the ground connections. If you move components or route traces, then just press the B key again to recalculate the copper fill. Uh, basically always remember to press B to update all of the fills. A very useful feature is trace length matching capability. And there's several different ways of using it. I'm going to demonstrate one of them. Here I've got a clock chip. There's two outputs here. I want the output to arrive at each of these connectors at the same time. If I try and lay out the traces for that, I'm going to click here and then press the X key to start laying out the trace and complete it here. There's another one here. And this is clearly shorter than this one, but I'm going to try and make it the same length. If you click on one of these traces at the bottom here, I can see the segment length, but I can see the routed length of the complete trace and that's 22.3 millimeters. If I do the same thing for this one, I can see it's 16.4 millimeters. So this is still much shorter than this one. I would need to extend this. If I click on route and then click on tune length of a single track, the one I want to tune is this one. I want to make it longer. So I, I would just click here and it's telling me that it's too short. It's 16 millimeters. 
out of 100 millimeters because it doesn't know what length I'm trying to tune to. Now I right click, this menu comes up so you can always refer to this and hit escape to get back to here. As I move the mouse, I've not selected left or right mouse button, I'm just moving the mouse around. It's still trying to tune it to 100 millimeters. Again, if I right click there and then this time click on length tuning settings, this comes up. I can change this to 22.3 and then click on OK. Now, as I move this around, you can see that it's actually still too short. If I right click, I can see that I can increase and decrease the amplitude by pressing three and four. Three will increase the amplitude. If I hit escape here, I could press the three button and you can see that that's growing as I do it. And now it's gone green, it's saying it's tuned. Press the left mouse button and that's complete. The trace length here should be the same as this one. Click on this and there it says it's tuned at 22.3 millimeters. Here is a more complete board. To get it looking tidy, I didn't do this all in one shot. I have to do things like click on delete on trace segments to turn them back into airwaves. I can click delete here and then redraw it or maybe click on shift delete and remove all of the airwaves for a particular net and then redraw them again. Click here, press the X key or make it a bit thicker. Click that. by doing that and also sometimes occasionally moving components around a bit eventually it all iterates towards the desired acceptable result. I just wanted to point out a couple of artifacts on this board that you might be interested to know about how it's done. One is that if you want to add via stitching like this you can do that using this icon. You can place vias anywhere you want. You can zoom in and see which net that's on but you can double click that and change the net as well. Something that you might want to do occasionally is to deliberately remove solder resist, i.e. like the green stuff on the boards, and have bare copper. What you have to do is draw using the F dot mask layer here. You select that and then you can use any of the drawing icons. I did that here. This is the F dot mask layer on top of a ground plane on the top side so that a screening can could be soldered if desired. Once you're happy with all this, keep an eye out on the unrated count at the bottom here. So once that's at zero, then you know you've turned all of the air wires into traces. And then definitely run the design rule check from the inspect menu. And take the time to consider every issue that it lists once you run the DRC. If you don't take this time, then you can almost guarantee that there will be a fault on the PCB. So this step is super important. In my case, I have three warnings of a trace that's unconnected. All the rest is silk screen related stuff. And to see these, and zoom in here click on any of these. So for instance, if I click here, it will show me with an arrow what the problem is. And the silk screen clipped by solder mask is not really an issue. It's more of a cosmetic thing. You could try fixing these perhaps in the footprint editor or by moving components or by moving a silk screen if it's text. Or you could choose to ignore these if you want to, but you should look through all of these and just confirm that. These three that I've got here concerning an unconnected end of a trace are deliberate. This is something unusual I'm doing here. I put down using the X button a trace, which I didn't connect anywhere else. I just left it like that. And the reason for this was my screening can needed to have a bit of bare copper at the top. And it extends slightly beyond the top ground plane, which you can see here. That's very unusual. I mean, you normally would not have to do anything like that. So that explains these three warnings which I'm receiving. And then everything else is silk screen related. Also use the 3D viewer to see if things look okay as well. It can be a handy thing to give a bit of extra confidence. You can press the center mouse button to pan around and zoom is with the scroll wheel. You can also use a cursor key to pan around as well if you want to. And if you hold down the left key you can then do this. So you can see here where I removed the solder mask. Once you're happy with that, then you're ready to create the cam output files, i.e. Gerber output. Once you think you're ready with the board and at a minimum check that the unrouted counter here is zero and you've pressed B to recompute all copper pores and you've set up the design rules and you also run the design rule check from the inspect menu here, then you may be ready for creating the Gerber output files.
The Gerber output is what ultimately gets sent to the PCB manufacturer. Often it's just bundled into a zip file. Now, the Gerber output files have no knowledge of the components or the schematic. It is instead a set of layers, lines, holes and shapes. Basically it's at a very low level intended for directing machines like plotters and CNC drilling tools. Click on File, Plot or you can click on File Fabrication Outputs and make sure the, that the format here is correct and type in any name here and this will then become a folder if one doesn't already exist off your project directory. I've kept the default layer selection here but make sure that the rest of the settings here look like mine if you're using JLC PCB because these are not the KiCad defaults. Consult the manufacturer website if you need help but the settings as shown here should be fine for at least JLC PCB. And you're going to be clicking both plot and generate drill files. First click on plot and you'll see here that approximately 10 files got generated which corresponds to the number of layers here plus one job file. Then click on generate drill files and again you'll need to make changes here to meet the manufacturer file format requirements. I'm going to change this to use alternate drill mode. Make sure this is definitely set to Gerber. Set this to millimeters. There, these items are now set for JLC PCB. Click on both the drill and the generate map file buttons. This will add a total of four more files into the same CAM output folder that you had. You can close these now. And here's the generated files. You're now almost done, but not quite. If you're doing this for work purposes, then you'll have your procedures anyway. Otherwise, even for home users, now's the time to inspect those Gerber files because the aim is to produce a PCB that requires very few modifications like bodge wires the first time around. So it's worth spending time now inspecting things. Also wait 24 hours at least before ordering the PCB so that you can look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and more relaxed mind before you send the files out. A review from a friend can also be helpful. It is worth trying to present it to someone if you can. Even if they're a non-expert, present it to anyone willing to listen and the process will help pick up problem areas. So far, four of the applications have been used, but this fifth one is very important because it's used to inspect the final output files that will go to the PCB manufacturer. You can load the Gerber files manually, or you can just click here to open the Gerber job file. Go to the folder where the files are generated, and then click that. You'll also want to load the drill files, and you can press Shift to select both of them together, so you can see them both here, and then click Open. All the layers and the two drill files that were open, all the information is visible here on the layer manager. At a minimum, what you'll be doing with this application is probably turning off all the layers first because it gets messy to see things and then just turn on one or two layers or just several layers at a time just so that you can visually inspect that the output is consistent with what you expect. So you might start, for example, with the edge cut layer. And I can see there that there's a slot here for a ribbon cable. Then add on the drill files. These ones are non-plated holes. And then you might add silkscreen. This is the top layer silkscreen to check that it looks fine and that there's no text on top of holes. Also with the mask layer, I can now confirm that since I know that there will be a heatsink here, I expected a box to be visible on this layer and it's there. Then I might turn off most of these layers except the holes and the silkscreen and use a measurement tool to check that everything is in its correct place. Make sure that the grid is set to a very fine value here. I'm expecting this to be 2.54 millimeters. So I can just approximately click here and that looks about right. I expect this height to be about 10 millimeters. If you hold down shift, then it becomes more vertical. That looks right. There are more powerful Gerber file viewers as well, but this one is good enough for visual inspection. Now you're ready to prepare the zip file for the PCB manufacturer. You might not need all of the files in the generated Gerber folder, but there's no harm in leaving them there. The manufacturer will be used to seeing files created from KiCad. That's the final file. To summarize, this video has covered some of the functionality in these first five applications listed here, but has not explored the image converter or any of the other tools. KiCad version six is still quite new, but there are blog posts on the Element 14 website for topics including working with 3D as well as 2D for graphics and board outlines. There is also some information on working with the Python programmability in KiCad 6 also on this site. The KiCad forum is really good as well. If you find any bugs, then I found the KiCad developers responsive at the GitLab site. It's a good idea to take a video recording as well of the problem 
and attach it when reporting the issue. Thanks for watching.